Thanks, Pat. Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to our 15th anniversary of the National Distance Learning Week Conference. We are now uh, kicking off day three with an amazing speaker, um, Dr. Alexandra Salas. But before I introduce her, uh, please allow me to thank our sponsors, uh, beginning with our gold sponsors. Many thanks D2L, Instructure, Logitech, NC Sarah Poly, uh, Tennessee State, TDU Horizon, and JDL Horizons, who's uh, providing this live broadcast in English and Spanish for us. Many thanks also to our silver sponsors, EDU Alliance, Harmonize, IntelliBoard, Information Age Publishing, Nearpod, Yamaha, Yellow Dig, um, and to our bronze sponsors, Anatomy Age, Arizona Telemedicine Program, South, um, uh, Southwest, rather, <laughs> Telehealth Resource Center, Enrollment Resources, Virtual Advisor, Proctorio, Video360, Viopta, Virtual Care, and Xanadu. Many thanks also to our USDLA friends. Uh, we're very grateful to all of you for um, your contributions to making this conference possible. If you are not already a USDLA member, uh, we extend a warm invitation uh, for you to join us as a member. Um, and also, if you would like to get involved in leading our organization, please um, uh, contact any one of us about serving on the, unit, on the USDLA Board of Directors. Um, our next national conference is July 17th through 20th in Orlando, Florida. Please mark your calendars. Um, we would love to invite you to submit proposals and um, to join us in Orlando. Um, we have webinars just about every Friday. We have different forums. We have an active LinkedIn group, and we also have uh, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram presence. So, Please get involved to your heart's content. Uh, we always appreciate um, your interest and your um, collaboration. Thank you for joining in our efforts. So today we will um, hear from Dr. Alexandra Salas, who will talk about her research with stewardship and the future of instructional delivery. But before we get started, please allow me to, um, to introduce our speaker. Dr. Alexandra Salas is Dean of Innovation, Teaching and Digital Learning Excellence and Educational Support Services at Delaware County Community College. Her background includes work as a dissertation editor and coach, an education consultant, speaker, and facilitator. She also has extensive post-secondary teaching experience in traditional and online platforms. Higher education uh, focus areas for Alex include leadership, systems thinking, student success, globalization, technology, and innovation. Her book, Numbers and Sense, Ensuring Student Success One Cohort at a Time, was published in April 2021 with Rome and Littlefield. Uh, her upcoming title about leadership exodus features interviews with higher ed presidents and professionals about agency and change during post-COVID. So without further ado, let's uh, send a warm welcome to Dr. Salas. Alex, the floor is yours. Hello, thank you. Um, well, just give me a moment to bring up the presentation. And please, um, Gio, if you could tell me what, do you yeah. see the title slide? Swap. Screens, please. Yes, perfect. Perfect. Okay, good. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that I was showing you the correct thing. So um, thank you very much. Um, I'm privileged to um, be here. It's an honor to speak with you this afternoon on uh, some conversations that I had with uh, leadership uh, during the pandemic time. Uh, so this session sh shares challenges and a focus on self-care and belonging lessons learned and possibilities for higher education that was curated during the summer and the fall of 2021 and the spring of 2022. For research and one-on-one -on -one conversations with college presidents and other higher education uh, professionals. Some of the states represented um, are New Jersey, Georgia, New Mexico, Illinois, New York, Washington, D.C., Nevada, Tennessee, California, and Pennsylvania. Switching. 
Okay. I hope you see the introduction slide. There's a slight delay. Um, so 22 higher education leaders uh, made time to share insights on the curiosities driving this book. Uh, the discussions invited leaders to discuss higher ed ecosystems and strategies and tools to support um, this dynamic interconnected system that we have in higher ed. Uh, the themes that reappeared from every discussion, and I also see it in the literature, you know, that I check into every day, focused again, as I mentioned earlier, on self-care, uh, belonging, mindfulness, um, and some of the lessons learned and possibilities imagined and yet to be imagined for higher ed. The key questions asked centered on their specific professional experiences during this time and the challenges faced. Questions asked the what, the how, the why behind decisions made and invited these leaders to guesstimate or approximate the future, particularly based on the research, resources that they have. A recent article published in the Harvard Business Review newsletter entitled Today's Leaders Need Vulnerability, Not Bravado, um, resonated with me. Um, and it's one of the, the inspirations, I, I think, that as, a, as an educator and also as a, as a writer and a researcher, you're, it never ends. you know. And so every time you come across new information, new conversations, you just want to keep adding to uh, what inspired you to start um, asking those questions in the first place. And the authors noted and concurred with the interviewees that I had, uh, the interviews that I had closing thoughts about the future. And so I'm just gonna quote a little piece, uh, a paragraph from the article. In a complex and uncertain world that demands consistent learning and agility, the most apt and adaptable leaders are those who are aware of their limitations and have the necessary, necessary humility to grow their own and others' potential and are courageous and curious enough to create sincere and open connections with others. They build inclusive climate and psychological safety that foster constructive criticism and dissent. Above all, they embrace truth. And I can certainly say that uh, those 22 interviews that I conducted pretty much uh, resonated and, and echoed a lot, of, a lot of what I just read to you, um, namely, having agility, flexibility, versatility um, in our abilities, in our ability to connect and respond to issues and um, in our receptivity to technology and the unknown. So as I mentioned, I, I talked to 22 um, individuals. Uh, they were senior leadership, also included academic search firms, educators, from two-year, four-year public and private institutions. A sentiment that is echoed by many uh, whom I met recognize that the relationships we build, how they are imagined, are important um, because it affects our understanding and willingness and openness to examine ideas, find solutions, and also keep up, help us to cultivate and learn, to debate, to innovate, to align and realign and collaborate. Um, and it also allows us to contribute to the sustaining critical systems that undergird higher education, the delivery of it, the operations, and also uh, the future. So as, as we all know, as um, participants in higher education, it consists of many components that serve to support uh, its mission and also to advance student success. Together, these separate communities of academic affairs and student affairs, infotechnology, institutional research, advancement, and the like, make up this larger ecosystem representative of the institutions and contribute to advancing these sustainable futures. So beginning at the Office of the President, these functional areas compose the operations of the college and aim to support the strategic plan, which serves as a guiding document. And again, in speaking with these leaders, it came down, back down to basics. Um, some had strategic plans that were very elaborate and felt that they had to synthesize them. Um, some had plans which were um, 
were up like a paperweight. You know, they hadn't they hadn't been uh, updated or they felt like needed to be updated. And so, you know, these individuals came from different uh, different places, didn't have different experiences, but all uh, wound up in the same um, to the, wound up on the same conclusion that what you know the communication is very important and having an understanding of how the ecosystem um, and the layers of higher education and how uh, it's important for these various areas to connect and communicate and work collaboratively in order to affect positive change. A research a recent article about leadership turnover reports on issues that cause these imbalances in higher education ecosystem. Uh, so for college presidents, stepping in after the exits of several leaders has meant trying to bring consistency and constancy to institutions that are in various states of flux. And I know that we have, we're now hopefully post-pandemic and that conversations of the pan pandemic sometimes are just you know, get getting old for some people, but the reality is that we have to continue to keep those at center and and um, top of mind in order to continue to learn from those from the lessons and understand that while the urgency is not what it was two years ago, uh, we can't relax and we can't just go back to what was. Um, so this could mean implementing strategic plans that have multiple starts and stops and overseeing neglected hiring processes or correcting misaligned um, budgets. Coordination and collaboration among all functional areas are important as a holistic practice embraced by these leaders. Examples of these include creating intuitive and aligned master plans that set a path, a vision, and milestones, touchstones, and supports. These should possess a transparent framework for accountability um, can also uh, include developing enrollment plans, uh, academic master plans, information technology plans, and also uh, consider non-credit and workforce development plans in the mix. Also, the, uh, there should be a reminder that shared governance could and can mean shared visions. Um, to follow are a couple of quick thoughts from in this slide, um, Dr. Shana Jackson, president of National State Community College in Tennessee, and also Dr. Paul Brooks, vice president for student affairs at um, Oakton Community College. And um, I would just like to call attention to Dr. Brooke paraphrases a quote uttered by many leaders that never waste a good uh, crisis. And that also was a phrase that resonated with many of those um, leaders uh, with whom I had a conversation with that, you know, once they were in crisis mode, they realized, you know, that it, it is a crisis and it is tragic, but it also presented a very important opportunity that uh, higher ed would be remiss not to act on. Um, Educause is another important resource that you know, I, I relied on time and time again and that other um, individuals in higher education um, read about constantly. Um, so in an article for Educause Review, it noted that those who have built online programs over the years will attest that effective online learning aims to be a learning community and supports learners, not just instructionally, but with co-curricular engagement and other social supports, they argued. Um, ultimately effective online education requires an investment in an ecosystem of learner supports, which takes time to identify and build. Again, once again, we hear the word and we see the word ecosystem. And I bring this up because this is National Distance Learning Week and the conversation of online education is front and center, particularly since it was our only form of delivery during the pandemic. In in speaking with Dr. Susan Aldrich, uh, who's now an executive higher education consultant, but was former president of Drexel University Online, she indicated that the pandemic further accelerated online growth. Um, and this is also um, a factor mentioned by other leaders uh, that I spoke with. University presidents and provosts are taking advantage of this post-pandemic environment to transform the universities by building digital ecosystems, recognizing that 
um, this online space uh, is merits uh, recognition as an ecosystem because it overlaps with so many of the other important areas, critical areas of higher ed. Future oriented universities, says Dr. Aldrich, used higher education emergency relief funds to invest in virtual infrastructure, multi channel communication systems for students, such as chat, video conference, email, and phone, of course, um, augmented websites um, for self service extended call center hours, and 24-7 tech support, uh, inclusive of advising by phone and video conferencing. So there were many opportunities uh, that came that rose out of the ashes of this uh, terrible pandemic that we all, that many of us survived. And here um, I ha we have some quotes from two other leaders, uh, Dr. P. Wesley Lundberg, who is at, at uh, San Diego uh, Miramar College. Um, he was formerly at Suffolk County Community College and uh, President uh, Michael Ziosi of um, Rowan College at Burlington County. Uh, again, two individuals who um, appreciate the, the opportunity to work together, to be flexible, and also recognize the pandemic as an accelerant and um, an accelerant that higher ed really needed to pay attention to, but it, it, took, it, took, the, it took this very traumatic um, point in time uh, for, for it to be a tipping point for, um, for us to be able to move the, lead, the needle in higher ed in many respects. Other things to consider. Uh, on top of the financial enrollment um, and pandemic exacerbated challenges, current and new leadership um, have been further tested by questions of access and outreach and support for a future perspective, non-traditional graduating classes of students. Um, as we know, higher ed counted on support from uh, CARES, the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act which allotted approximately um, $14 billion to the Office of Post-Secondary Education as the Higher Education Emergency Relief Fund are for. The question now is how will institutions fare several years from now due to the enrollment um, decline? And we can see how um, leaders who stepped in during the pandemic, others who stepped uh, in after um, things began to settle down, and others who have been and, and continue to stay the course throughout the pandemic have been um, making, making changes, you know, uh, really taking a look and, and drilling down on what can be done differently. What have we learned? Um, what improvements need to be made? What will the new normal be like? And that's a term that uh, some scoff at or, or think, you know, uh, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily become a popular term, uh, but it, it is, you know, we have to think about uh, what will normalcy look like in higher education and in our own personal lives. Other questions also include uh, about people being vaccinated, um, are processes changing? There, there are some institutions where it became a mandate. Now, uh, some have relaxed those and they're not requiring vaccinations anymore. Well, how will we have what will the conversation look like in the future about vaccination? Um, what are sustained expectation, expectations? Uh, what lessons from the last two years might stick? Um, and what is life going to look like um, when COVID becomes more flu-like and seasonally manageable? Are we there? Are we there now? Or um, are we there yet? So ultimately, innovation as we know, it is an iterative and additive process that involves ongoing exploration, examination, and dialogue among thought leaders and other change agents, change agents who are open to trial and error. Um, here so practice makes per perfect, or in the case of leveraging technology in the classroom space, um, it has improved. Um, uh, uh, in conversation with former president from Camden County College in New Jersey, uh, Dr. Gordon, he said that uh, they that the college got better at instruction. You know, um, he he mentioned how transitioning students um, just became um, it, well, well. Although it was challenging, um, 
he said it was really a worthwhile experience, you know, and something that they would continue to invest in. Uh, looking at their infrastructure and making sure that there were the supports to be able to provide um, instruction in an in, in online or hybrid modality. Uh, he, he discussed how it was just the, the convenience of it all made it something um, worth looking into and, um, and sticking to. And he noted how, you know, as community college students have transportation challenges, childcare challenges, workplace challenges, and the virtual environment uh, was a piece that um, they had not really taken a look at as they did during the pandemic and realized how, you know, while online is not necessarily for everyone, but this convenience um, factor is truly uh, important and how students recognize that now they could do, they could learn from their homes and wherever they are and it was empowering. Um, so looking at the ecology of higher education, uh, rec make, make us recognize that, that there are important areas for new, new leadership to attend to and be mindful of. And so um, onboarding is an area that needs to be continuously looked at. Uh, new faces, right? Um, there was a lot of change during the pandemic, and then we're still seeing the aftermath of, of that. Uh, there, there was restructuring, um, uh, new priorities, right? And also um, organizational structures. And so these are these are areas that now have provided, um, you know, they have kind of bubbled to the top and they have always been important, but with new, le new leadership at the helm, um, you, these are areas that they have to address in order for, them to be able to move forward and advance the mission of their, of their college. So again, I you know I had mentioned um, higher ed as an, as an ecology, and uh, Dr. Don Borden, uh, former president at Camden, also um, spoke about this issue, recognizing that um, that it's important to have a service thinking mentality uh, in higher ed. Um, having flexibility would certainly empower leaders and, and institutions to support students because they could easily pivot, pivot um, now and in the future. And it was a lesson that they learned uh, so that they could be better prepared um, to meet students where they are now and forever. Um, he said, so I think that malleability is important. And, you know, for us to change the way that we were taking advantage of these opportunities. Um, you know, it was very important uh, to be able to, to facilitate how students learn, uh, just was, uh, provided, provided students with less of a burden to worry about, you know, um, now, but you also have to have the resources when we provide online education and, uh, and provide the services so that students understand what is needed in order to be successful in this environment. Um, having the class alone online and having access to computer isn't it, you know, so you still need to have community to be able to um, provide support services and to embrace those students that um, perhaps are not as prepared um, online because they've never done it before. According to the uh, 2022 Inside Higher Ed Survey of College and University Presence, um, most presidents indicated that their institutions implemented beneficial changes during the pandemic. And the presidents agreed that they will keep some of the changes um, even after the pandemic ended. And they were able to implement some of the positive long lasting institutional changes during the pandemic. Um, I spoke with Dr. Gregory Fowler, um, who's the president of the University of Maryland Global Campus in Washington, DC. And he noted how higher ed leadership should focus on their mission. And um, Dr. Fowler added that with the proper technological infrastructure, higher ed can provide proactive education supports. So um, in, in talking with him and, and others and also reading what, what has been ha happening of late, sticking, sticking to the message, to the mission is also very important because higher ed institutions need to realize and be true to themselves, um, you know, 
If you're a for-profit institution, that's what you are. If you're a public institution, that's what you are. If you're serving um, community college students, that is who you are. And, and be able to realize what is your reality and how can you learn from the lessons learned and learn from your colleagues and sisters uh, organizations to determine, okay, what are the factors that we are facing with? What is the aftermath that's uh, real to us now? And what are some of the strategies that we can implement that will really be sustainable? You know, not just a one-shot um, opportunity. Margaret Rankle um, published last year um, in the New York Times that friendship is forged across time, the good fortune and tragedy of it. And I believe that so is leadership, um, particularly having had the privilege to have conversations with um, 22 uh, individuals um, to discuss this very important issue and this very fluid issue, which is uh, learning, teaching modalities, and um, how that might be delivered in the future. A recent article in Harvard, Harvard Business Review echoed similar sentiment, um, that in a complex and uncertain world that demands constant learning and agility, the most apt and adaptable leaders are those who are aware of their limitations. And that is sticking to your mission understanding what your limitations are. You can shoot for the stars, but whatever ideas and innovation you'd like to implement, it has to be manageable. You have to have buy-in. You have to have people surrounding that idea that want to make it a reality. Um, Edward Cornish, the former president of the World Future Society, highlights seven lessons that also can be learned. Prepare for what you will face in the future. Anticipate future needs. Use um, core information when necessary, right? If that's all that you have. Expect the unexpected. Think long-term as well as short-term. Dream productively and learn from your predecessors. I thought that that was poignant and I wanted to include that. Um, also, it's important to understand that actions impact one or part of the system can, in, can invariably and inevitably affect other parts of the system. Um, and it's important to know that because higher ed has been um, famous uh, for working in silence. And what the pandemic did was break down those silence by the need for people to work together, speak to one another, have a better understanding, um, creating greater affinities and, and roots. You know, creating a root system. Um, Lorraine Harricon of UT Austin was talking about college libraries and how they might be represented in the future. And she used the term closet futures, which um, I respectfully adopt. Um, and she, in talking about library systems, she mentioned how can the library advance the mission of the college, embedding it in self, itself in the core mission of the institution. Uh, having a strategic plan or plausible futures um, being are the role of the library in terms of data management, transformative negotiation, et cetera, and new emerging roles. So in closing, I paraphrase and um, by saying, convert sinews of resistance into powerful network works that can strengthen and advance education. Uh, imagine how institutions can serve ever-changing demographics, generations of baby boomers, um, millennials, uh, Generation Z, and the future alpha. You know, it's important to recognize that if we stand still, the, those around us will not, time will not, uh, trends will not. So it's it's to our, uh, to our benefit to just stay in the mix, stay informed, continue to have conversations um, as, leadership continues, expands, changes, transition. You know, co companies are desperately, uh, are desperate for employees and they can't maximize their, their potential unless they have the talent that they need. There's a need on both sides for partnerships that can be fulfilled, but it needs to be managed well and carefully. Um, 
you know, this is this is something that uh, Dr. Aldridge uh, mentioned during an RNL uh, graduate online insights interview, and I thought was very uh, very significant to to share. You know, thinking about how as institutions of of learning, it's important for higher ed to be connected to what uh, the business businesses, business outlook, occupational outlook is is in need of so that we can be talking from the same uh, from the same page, building those bridges so that students coming in will see a path out and a um, you know a competitive marketplace waiting for them. But they need to be prepared with the skills. Um, it's important to think on a strategic level, launch a think tank of industry experts, enhance or engage in industry advisory panels, advise curricula, and someone dedicated to building those relationships and coordinated efforts. You know, these are just some uh, some of the ideas shared by some of our groups. So now at this point, I, I'd like to pass it on to you. Maybe we can have a conversation. How do you visualize higher ed in the future? And I have a, um, a QR code and a link if you would like to submit your ideas, uh, I would be happy to then share uh, what, what that might look like with any of our attendees and, uh, and add to the discussion about what are our thoughts about higher education and how that those might transpire moving in the future. So if also, if, um, if you can't participate in the Mentimeter, uh, if you would like to share a lesson learned during this time, I invite you to also email me. And um, that is my contact information, my LinkedIn account, and my personal website. And I thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to uh, discuss them with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. Could I possibly bother you to back it up to the Menti? Um... Mentimeter, sure. Yes, please. We'll um, also put that on the live platform. Sure. Thank you. I ran through the presentation. <laughs> no worries, no worries. So um, to our audience, we'll post the Menti. We'll post the Menti in just a moment. Um, but sure. please chime in and if you have any thoughts or um, or any questions uh, for Dr. Salas, please chime in. I can share the screen. Okay. Thank you so much. Elena Picora says, thank you for the great presentation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think this is a conversation that is ongoing. Um, I just I just had the opportunity to have a snapshot of these um, these leaders representing. Uh, a variety of, of, of higher ed institutions, asking them, you know, how are how are you coping? What are you what are you doing? What do you think it might look like in the future? I mean, they were tough tough times, you know, a higher education having to reinvent itself, and so it's going to be very interesting in the next few years to see what that looks like and what the role of online online education will be. I will, I will, we will all be staying tuned and I will be continuing to ask questions and learn. Um, TA Essex says, thank you. This was very informative. Constance um, Plunga, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Constance says, thank you. Um, so um, to our audience members, please be kind enough to um, complete our 
anonymous survey evaluation before you leave, um, helping us uh, provide um, some feedback. And meanwhile, we invite any thoughts, any questions for Dr. Salas. So Dr. Salas, could I maybe ask you um, of, of the experience of, um, of working with these leaders, um, is there something that sort of comes to the top as um, uh, most commonly mentioned by all leaders? I, I believe that um, they all at some point spoke about recognizing um, the mental health of the college community, the importance of knowing, you know, or learning how to deal with this trauma and which was new to everyone. They all mentioned uh, vulnerability and and I think that's really significant because what the pandemic did, it created this blurring of the lines between our professional and our personal lives. And we could see it in everything, you know, listening to the radio on the news, um, in class, at work, you know, you hear the lawnmower, you hear the snowblower, you hear the garbage truck coming up to, you know, or the delivery or the doorbell ringing, or you see, you know, you hear babies crying or people's pets jumping, you know, at the most inopportune moment. And that would have never happened. And so what does that have to do with higher ed? I just think that it made everyone realize that despite our titles and our level of responsibility that we're all people. And um, this mutual respect, um, I believe resurfaced, not that it didn't exist before, but as people, um, we are, are um, the things that may be affecting us became more public. Um, perhaps not everybody's, not, not everybody, appreciates that or, or wants that to happen. People are very, you know, private, uh, but it, it impacted how we lived, how we work, how we communicate. And so folks in leadership capacity had to learn to navigate that while they were also addressing their own issues. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, it just, it just creates um, a culturally, um, emotionally sensitive or alert um, environment, which now I think makes us better or can make us better uh, because we realize that, you know, yes, we can, I mean, because work continue to get done. You know, um, people still work, people still taught, um, you know, payroll still happens, you know, people continue to get paid. Uh, we found we found ways, you know. So I would say that mindfulness, mental health, innovation, agility, versatility, flexibility—those were a lot of terms that came up over and over again. Um, and so, rather than um, talking about things in a negative way, you know, there's always you know resistance or you know this this group against the other group. It was more about we recognize our differences, you know, we have to collaborate, we have to, we must, in order to make things happen, we must, we have to work on it, you know, so civility, civil discourse, you know, um, just find solutions find, uh, as, about, as, about, as opposed to problem solving, it's, let's find solutions, how, how can we make it happen? And I think that's really important because it's just, it's just a, a little shift, but a shift that makes a difference. Um, and um, and also mission, being mission driven, um, student student centered, but just being uh, high, you know higher ed centered. You know how how do we make this happen? Well, I think the fear that doors were going to um, shut down, you know, and and the higher education as we know it, brick and mortar, vanished. And, and we did see some of that. Um, for example, in the state of Pennsylvania, the there has been some you know, mergers, right? Um, you know, around the, the, the country, there were some institutions that did close their doors, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But 
then there was also, it did drive, it did inspire uh, innovation of how, how can we keep our doors open? How can we address enrollment issues? How can we retain our students? Because it, it's, it's less about getting more through the door. It's about how do we keep the ones we have, you know? Um, you know, like in looking at retention rates. Okay, so let's say your retention rate is 80%, which is very good. What do we do about the 20 that we're not retaining? You know, so um, I, I just I just think it was really, I learned so much um, having these conversations with, and I and I am um, very thankful that they were open and were able to take the time to speak with me. Um, and I, I don't know if the pandemic had not happened, if that would have been as easy. Um, I, I think that because we we all got used to using Zoom, like in the past, I don't think I would have thought of sending an invite to a college president saying, do you have a few minutes to talk to me? <laughs> you know, because and but because we had Zoom, we were able to do the face to face on Zoom as opposed to a conversation over the phone, which wouldn't have had the same impact. They got to see me, I got to see them. Some of them talked to me from their offices, others were driving, others were, you know, so it was very, it was formal, but it was informal at the same time. You know, um, I, we weren't there to just have a chat. You know, they don't have time for that. You know, they have a college to run, but they appreciated what I was trying to learn and gave me the time of day. And I will be forever grateful for those minutes that we share. Melissa Rendon actually was chiming in and saying, um, what a great point about these blurred lines. And uh, we also have some audience questions. Christine Pruitt is asking, do you hear any differences based on the institutional type that these leaders came from? You know, that's interesting, right? Um, because they all face the same challenge. Even those who had the infrastructure face the same challenge. I think that we could probably, I mean, I, I, I'd have to look at the data to see institutions that did not lose enrollment. For the most part, enrollment did, um, you know, institutions across the board suffered. Even with for profit institutions, there, there was a dip. And maybe it was, nothing of their own doing. I mean, if you were an online institution that where enrollment dipped, it wasn't because of anything that the institution was doing is people's lives were being impacted. They had to become caregivers, caretakers, or they got sick themselves, or they had to go to work. So they, so in education was not front of mind for them. Um, so uh, what I found in common, like, yes, you know, they, there are different priorities across the board, whether you're a community college or if you're a private institution. You know, um, you know I think that they have different uh, priorities, but a priority that they all share is student success. <laughs> you know, I think uh, but the fact that they all want to deliver quality instruction. And I, and I thought that to me, it was just a way to say, you know, we all have different, um, we all have different goals, you know, institutional goals. We, we may have um, different types of students or de student demographics vary. But during this time, presidents across all institutions, they had affinity groups, they had affinity chats, they talked to each other, learning from each other, understanding that in many cases, they may be competing for that same student. But there was I, I just thought it was a beautiful thing, the rule of engagement, right? The respect, leader to leader, institution to institution, that, you know, everyone has their, their you know, the priorities and their goals to meet and match. But yet, knowing that, um, as, as uh, Dr. Fowler indicated, you know, you, you're a massive institution, you're an ASU, for example, um, you have, you know, tens of thousands of students. Right, so that you don't have the same worry as a small private liberal arts college that whose whose um, who's, uh, enrollment is really dwindling. You know, um, so I just feel that while the competition is there, 
Um, and, you know, there's a, a term, which is not mine, I have not coined it, uh, cooperation, right? So you have to learn to cooperate, you have to learn to, um, to compete, right? And sometimes it's about, you know, we can talk about articulation agreements between two and four institutions. The goal is to work together to create a pipeline, not to cannibalize each other or steal students from each other. So how do we make it work? We all want the same thing. We all want to survive. We want to keep our doors open. How do we do that? Um, it's not about revealing trade secrets, right? And I'm not going to tell you how I do it necessarily, right? Because, you know, we, we want, we want to, each place wants to be special for students to want to come and be a part of that campus community. But at the same time, there's so much that we can learn together. And having these ongoing chats and, and looking at our own data and drilling down on the data, like the use of data dashboards. I mean, I think the technology, we're at a really impressive time in, in the higher education timeline where there's so much that we can do. Systems are increasingly speaking to one another so that we can learn um, about about retention, not just as a number, but drilling, drilling it down to uh, you know, gender, race, equity, socioeconomic, and there's just so many different issues, disciplines. Um, so a student can be doing great across the board, but then you could look at where there's some pain points, um, whether the student is first generation, whether it's an international student, or, you know, there's just so many different dynamics, whether it's an adult learner or, um, you know, a, a student with, that receives accommodations. I mean, it just could be anything. It could be anything, but the data can tell us a story and we just have to, we have to look at it. You know, we have to look at it and speak to the various areas of our institution who are responsible for a piece of that data. You know, I believe the leadership has to communicate so that we all have a better understanding of what that story is so that we can figure out ways to, um, to affect important changes, the necessary changes at our at our own, you know, college. So yeah, so, I mean, lots to lots to learn. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, TA Essex was saying earlier, um, it really allowed, allowed leaders to assess if they truly had balance within their home and work life. And the balance was completely off when everyone was working from home with kids doing school and parents doing work. Yeah. Right, right. And in, in some cases, some leaders were in their offices and the rest of the, the staff was at home and they had to face that and, and wonder, you know, how do I, you know, how do I do this? You know, and how, how they were feeling, you know, because they're human beings too. Yes, they're at the helm. Um, and I, it was just, just very, very interesting to see the human side of leadership and how, where they get the strength, where they get the strength to continue to lead. They also need a support system. And I think that, Part of that support system, in addition to it being your own families, and you know, personally, it was um, the the their um, the, you know the, their own the leaders at at other institutions, you know, their affinity groups. I think that was very very helpful, mm -hmm. and to have the support of their boards, of course, mm -hmm. and the community that who stood by them and relied on them to make these decisions. You know, we're back on campus. We're not back on campus. You know, we, you know, what kind of modalities are we going to have? Um, and, you know, moving forward, what, what is going to happen? Yeah, so, yeah it, remains, it remains to be seen. I'm sure there's more, more change on the horizon. <laughs> and then um, I believe it was in the context of um, the pandemic exposing all these um, dormant issues. Um, and Christine, correct me if I'm wrong. Christine was asking, um, let me try to scan through this. I lost my sleep for a second. Um, she was saying, what suggestions do you have for those who find ourselves at institutions that are not openly recognizing these issues? Um, and Christine was also saying, uh, it can make us better if leaders are willing to acknowledge, but she's not convinced that they are. So what would you uh, suggest to those at institutions who are kind of not feeling comfortable recognizing these issues openly. Right, I mean, I I believe that prior to the pandemic, it was very easy for leadership or middle management even to ignore some of the issues. Like, and, and an issue, you know, it's National Distance Learning Week, online education, 
as as an obvious viable option for instructional delivery. Um, some institutions had an infrastructure, and others didn't. Some had an infrastructure, but there was dust on it. <laughs> you know, they didn't really use it. They didn't really maximize the use of it. But then, you know, necessity breeds creativity and innovation. And those who didn't have it went out and bought one. You know, they bought a learning management system. They had to invest in it because how else are they going to do things? And others who had the system said, oh, I didn't realize I had this. You know, we can, we, you know, we're we're actually quite prepared. Um, uh, and 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 I think that there, you you find both extremes, right? Those who were who didn't have an infrastructure, didn't think they needed one ever. You know, maybe it just wasn't something that they felt they needed. Others had it, didn't maximize it, um, and others were way ahead, had the infrastructure. So it was an easy. Um, it was an easy shift for, for them. You, there will always be naysayers. There will always um, be resistance. But after what we lived, um, it's important not to be short-sighted. And we can no longer say that it's that online education isn't uh, an equal to, um, you know, and to instructional delivery. Is it good for everyone? Uh, that's a personal decision. You know, uh, a person can try it. And if they're distracted, they have too many obligations and they have no time management, then they'll realize that it might not be for them. But for many who didn't, who didn't even use technology and then found themselves with this opportunity, they had to learn it's not easy. You need support systems. You can't just throw up a learning management system um, just upload some documents and say, boom, there we have online education. It's not like that. You, There has to be training. There has to be professional development. There has to be a process for creating and revising courses. There has to be a support system for questions and tech support. Uh, you know, but, but you, you you build these systems. You know, they, they need to be sustainable um, so that you can scale up. Because uh, otherwise, it'll flop like anything else. And so um, to those, if you're in a situation where you're in an institution that doesn't believe it, um, well, you know, there, there's plenty of data out there to support the contrary. And um, as we saw in the last few years, there was an exodus. And there was an exodus for many reasons. Some were planned retirements and others were uh, individuals who decided this is not for me. I, I no longer want to do it, or I don't want to learn something new. I, you know, I, I just don't want to do it. And so it opens the door for others who do. Sometimes you can't, you, you can't convince someone. Um, and it's not about convincing. I think it's about that mutual exchange and that conversation and that respect to give an idea an opportunity um, for it to work. Uh, but for someone to flat out say, I'm a non-believer. Um, this is useless. This can't work. Um, no. Okay. Uh, you know, they, it's their right to be able to say that. But the real question is, um, do those people have a seat at the table and do they want to affect positive change? You know, do they want to address the problems at the institution and what is needed? And if what is needed is, let's say, a learning management system, or a process for creating and revising courses, then that's what is needed. But you need others at the table to have that conversation so that you could arrive at the decision that might help. You know, because you do need buying. You need buying. Um, and the state, all the stakeholders need to be at the table so that voices are heard. Yeah. Um, I remember the other day Dr. Jerry Henley was saying that for for change management, it takes for us to face our issues before we can even address them or, you know, begin to uh, implement solutions. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, some, some people and some leaders are visionary and they have foresight, you know, so they don't have to live it to know that it might happen or that they have to be prepared. But now that we all have lived it, you know, why torture ourselves? <laughs> Let's just be prepared. Let's yeah. be prepared. Because if it's not that again, it could be something else. So why not take this time and just learn 
just learn, maximize, capitalize on what we learned. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Salas. That thank was you. a great presentation and, and um, follow-up commentary. So um, to those leaders who did um, sort of uh, have the courage to embrace the challenge, to find innovative solutions, to make mistakes, as our keynote speaker was saying, um, I would like to invite Ms. Wendy Pate, um, who chairs our awards committee, to tell us a little bit about our awards. Wendy, please. And while uh, Wendy's getting ready and um, uh, will we'll tell us a little bit about our words, um, I would also invite you to continue staying tuned. Um, uh, a great continuation to Dr. Salas's presentation at 3 p.m. Eastern today, uh, Dr. Melanie Shaw is going to talk to us about the Chief Online Learning Officer in the post-pandemic world. Uh, Wendy, please. We'll see if I can stay on my, my internet's really unstable today. Uh, USC awards, we're finalizing the categories and we will be opening them in the beginning of December before December 15th is my goal. So real short, so I don't drop again, please keep your eyes on usdla.org under awards. They will be uh, nomination information in there as well as uh, pricings to submit your award. So I encourage you to please keep your eyes on the website for more details to come. Thank you so much, Wendy. We just posted our website um, on the Edubision chat along with a fresh link to the post survey evaluation. Uh, with that, we thank you all for taking the time to join us and to learn uh, from Dr. Salas today. Alex, thank you so much for the great presentation. Everyone have a lovely afternoon and we'll see you back at 3 p.m. Eastern. Take care. Yay. <laughs> Very nice job. See, I just sat there in the background, just listened in. Monitored, made sure everything looks good. Saw Wendy drop out a few times. It's all good. How's the work? Yeah, Wendy. Let's see how we did. Yeah, we'll get statistics afterwards. You had quite a few comments, which was good. So that's good engagement there. Yeah, we did. And, and uh, hold on.